Hi, everybody, and welcome to DRF Weekend Game Plan. I'm Dan Ullman, along with expert DRF handicapper, analyst, and columnist Marcus Hirsch. And each week here on Weekend Game Plan, we're going to give a couple of spot plays. Hopefully, it's some nice prices that you can take advantage of. Marcus is going to have his written piece online available Wednesday evening and, of course, in the Friday, uh, in the Friday, Saturday edition of Daily Racing Form. Three races this week, Marcus. Let's take a look at the field for the test, the most important race for three-year-old Philly sprinters in North America. Some big names in this race, but the key to the race is the pace. Serengeti Empress Kafefi, two one-way speeds. Do you envision a hot pace duel? Um, it's hard to see that not happening in this case. I mean, sometimes you can get tricked with these things because uh, everybody's looking at the same thing, the jockeys, the connections, and, um, you know, nobody wants to uh, sacrifice a horse with a very legitimate chance to win the race, as both of those horses have uh, on the horns of a, of a speed duel. But we know that Serengeti Empress has to be in front. I mean, I just, maybe they'll try to just take a little hold and come around it. I know they're saying they're going to the front, but and Kofebe is incredibly fast. Um, I, I I think they're going to be blazing. I think they'll both try for the lead, and I think they're going to be rolling. Now, most folks that are handicapping the pace scenario, they're going to agree with you. They're going to think there's a hot pace duel, and they're going to say there's a very logical closer sandwiched in between them in the gate, and that's the number two, Bella Fina, who's the morning line favorite and will likely be the favorite at post time. She's mm -hmm. a multiple grade one winner. She has a lot of credentials on paper, and there are a lot of folks that think that maybe she's been running at the wrong distances all along, that maybe she's more effective sprinting. I think you think she's more reputation than substance right now. Yeah, that's what I wrote in uh, the copy for this uh, this weekend game plan. And I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. What, what's your feeling about it? And I'm curious because I haven't really talked to many people about this horse, and I don't know what the I don't really have my finger on the pulse of the way uh, people perceive her generally. I I, I have not, I mean, I, she's run some solid races. Don't get me wrong, and I'm not going to be surprised if she ends up winning this race. But um, I mean, do you, do you think she's more paper tiger or tiger? I'm not sure about that. I think she's talented. I, I think there's no doubt she's talented. I really think she's actually been doing well at the wrong distance because, in my opinion, her most impressive race was the Santa Inez, her seasonal debut at seven furlongs. She she just destroyed a weaker field there. The Kentucky Oaks, she got further back than usual. I think the distance was a little too far for her. This distance is okay, but I'm not sure she has such an edge that I want to play her as a favorite in this exactly. spot. And I think that's really the key to weekend game plan and the key to betting any race. Well, it's, so it's, if the, yeah. go ahead. No, no, go. I mean, that's just how I, that's just the approach I take. It's not a question of who, yeah, like, can this horse win the race? Of course you can. I mean, I, I'm, for me, it's always in every selection that I make for the racing form, it's a balance of what chance the horse I have, I think the horse has, and the prices relative to the other horses. I mean, you, you, you've got to find, the right balance between price and chance. You're absolutely right about that. Now, other folks that say, okay, we don't believe in this favorite. They see Chad Brown. They see an undefeated filly in Royal Charlotte. They see her drawn outside of the speeds, likely to get a good trip. I think Royal Charlotte's pretty good. But I also think the waters are very deep in this year's edition of the test. And she's going to take play as well. No, I, absolutely. I, um and that's why I picked out this race, because I wasn't forced to choose a horse in this race. But I, for me, it was a great opportunity because of this combination of factors. The, the, the pace duel that I, that's hard not to see developing between the two very fast horses, one of whom at least. I don't know how much play Kofebe is going to take. I mean, I, that's hard to say. Um, Serengeti Empress is going to take a little money. But... So there's that. Then there's the fact that I think that Bellafina is, while talented, is um, going to take more money than she probably deserves. And then getting to Royal Charlotte, the horse that Chad Brown, Javier Cancellano, undefeated in four starts, an easy winner of the victory ride. She's going to be the logical alternative. I, I, I respect what she's done, um, but she has run four races in a row now, improved every start. Uh, watching her run... You know, she's not this massive steed who is just, you know, clunking along and is better than these horses going short. She looks like strictly a sprinter to me. Very fine, you know, stalking sprinter with a decent amount of speed, too, and she hasn't done anything wrong. I just don't think that she has a ton of room to improve after already improving so much. 
I feel like she's probably going to be what she was last time. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe she takes another step forward. But I'm not a huge fan of her at the price at all. Um, and so in just digging around a little bit, I, I last shot this horse, Trenchtown Cat, who ran on turf for first four races and actually ran some, some decent races. She, I, I mean, I thought she showed talent even going two turns. But when they cut her back to dirt sprints in her last two starts at Gulfstream Park, I am um, yeah, you know, the first race, you know, she didn't run against any Tigers, but there was a horse heavily favored in there. And, and these are older horses she's running against in both that race and the Grade 2 Princess Rooney. And in the prep for that, she just ran over the favorite. And uh, even though she was beaten going seven furlongs in the Princess Rooney, I thought she stayed decently. She was very far ahead in the third place horse. And really, I thought ran on well. And what really caught my eye about her, Dan, is uh, kind of the gear she showed. You know, and so many dirt horses have one strong, even the good ones, they are fast or they have one sustained run. There aren't that many horses that have that kind of push button turf acceleration. And especially in the race two starts ago, she showed me that. I always like to see that because I just think it's a sign that the horse might be unusually talented. Um, this horse, I think, the God I read RT is up, which hurts the price a little bit. But I do, with all those other alternatives, even in the short field, I do think she's going to be overlooked and is going to be a fair price. Oh, I agree. She has to be a price in this race. She's double digits. Everything you said made sense. I made her my second choice in the stakes preview. The four, Trenchtown Cat, 12 to 1 on the morning line. Marcus's selection in the test will stay at Saratoga for a very good betting race. Race number 10 is at a mile on the inner turf. Let's take a look at the field for the Della Rose. Phillies and mares, four-year-olds and up. I'm going to assume that that Stormy is going to be the favorite in this race. She's got credentials. She's come back very good as a four-year-old. Her race in the Distaff Turf Mile was just fine. There's a layoff here, though, that you have to deal with. And again, at a short price, I don't think she has such an edge. And now with that layoff question looming over our heads, I don't want to bet her to win as the favorite. Yeah, I don't either. Um, I was definitely impressed with her Distaff Turf Mile, but let's keep in mind that was the best race she'd run in her life. She had shown flashes as a three-year-old, and I don't think that was just a fluky, illegitimate sort of performance. I I think she has talent and probably is a better four-year-old. But after she got going, you know, with a good run in Jenny Wiley and then the good second uh, to Bo Recall in the Distaff Turf Mile, um, she was entered, <coughs> excuse me, in the Just a Game on Belmont card and was scratched, I think, the morning of the race. David Grenning from the race before reported she got cast in her stall. That was what caused whatever physical issue she had. I don't know what physical issue, what, what the issue was, but... Uh, she got back on the work pattern fairly quickly, but it's just an interruption in the rhythm she was in. And since she had hit that career peak, you know, back in the spring in Kentucky under, you know, in a different form cycle, I, I can't assume that she's just going to run back to that under completely different circumstances. Now, Marcus, you're a man of many hats at Daily Racing Form. One of them is you're an international or one of our two major international experts, along with Steve Anderson. Stella Di Camelot from the Chad Brown Barn began her career in France, raced in Italy, did very well on all sorts of footing. Let's take a look at her most recent start, the Grade 3 Intercontinental. It was interesting that they cut her back to seven furlongs. And as you see, she is rolling on the outside. It took another Chad Brown horse named Significant Form to beat her, and that horse would be very salty in here. Yeah, and not only that, Dan, as I'm sure we can see in the replay, while Significant Form was kind of ridden for luck down the inside, she got lucky enough to find the seam and saved all the ground, while Stella de Camelot was out wide, not just out wide, but at kind of, I thought, a key moment when Significant Form was really gearing up. She got stuck for a minute, a minute. She had stuck for a second behind two horses before she was able to come outside, extricate herself, and come with a 10.97 final furlong, which was the fastest in that race. I think uh, Mr. Brown was just, that was kind of a getting her back to the races race. She had run so well first time out in the U.S. after coming from France. Uh, ran, ran a huge race in the Pebbles. Disappointed at Churchill in her second start, long layoff. I, had talk, I was covering the Intercontinental, so I talked to the trainer before the race, and he said that he had, I think he had four horses in the race, but she was one of those that was training well, but he wasn't sure exactly what to expect. What I really liked about her is, well, first of all, there are enough horses in the race, the barring scratches, um, that I don't think that she's just going to get totally hammered. I, she could get bet down to three to one or something like that. But if you look, she worked back at Saratoga 13 days after the Intercontinental. This race has a very particular condition. It's non-runners have a graded stake in 2019. 
Um, it just looks like they decided, okay, this is going to be a good spot for this filly to get a win. Um, obviously, the barn has a oodles of older filly and mare turf horses. They have to pick their spots if they don't want to run up against their own horses. Uh, this is, seems like the ideal situation for her. I think that she's probably going to be a little better at a two-turn middle distance than seven-eighths, one-turn. She does have a kind of wicked turn of foot at her best, and I think we're going to see that in this race. And in this big field, there should be some pace to set her up. And I agree with our colleague, David Aragona's morning line. I think four to one is just about right where she deserves to be. I think that's where she's going to be at post time. And I think she's very fair at that price. Let's head out to Southern California for the grade two yellow ribbons uh, handicap. It is race number eight. We'll take a look at the field right now, going a mile and a 16th on the turf. And listen, there are two big names in here that are going to take a lot of money. One is the wind machine, Vasilika. She is going to be favored. Her gamely was good. She beat a very nice horse in Rimska. It wasn't the fastest race in the world. And again, maybe this is the spot against some pretty good horses where you can try to beat her. She's good at Del Mar. We know she loves Santa Anita. It's hard to knock her. You can't knock a wind machine like this. But at the price she's going to be, there are other options. Well, I mean, I'm going through all these form lines and seeing, well, okay, I don't think Rimska, first of all, you're right. When she beat Rimska in that race in the game, like, for me, that was the first time that she showed she could beat a higher, a truly higher level horse. Uh, I don't think that any of the horses she'd beaten in her all of her wins prior to that were even, I mean, Farhan Murrah had her moments, but she's kind of very limited. She's a one-dimensional front runner. She beat her in the Golda Cover, one of her better wins. Half length over paved and Cambodia. Cambodia had a moment two, two years ago. But I mean, the one time, Dan, that I see where she ran against legitimate horses in the matriarch, I mean, she finished fourth. She got beat by Uni, Daddy is a Legend, and Kidura. And those, to me, if Rimska wasn't at her best, and I don't think she was in the game, those are easily the three best horses against which she's run, and she couldn't beat them. I, I again, you're right about knocking, and I have kind of knocked this horse before because I do think that wins, wins, wins gets you more recognition than, I mean, I just like to parse the form a little more granularly, and I am still completely unsold that this is a, a top-level filly. So she has to deal with Bo Recall. <clears throat> Bo Recall has been fabulous this year uh, since really starting to come to hand at fairgrounds, and then she ran two very strong races at um, Churchill and at Belmont, where she was she had no chance um, against rushing fall in that race at Belmont, and I thought she ran just as well, if not better, than she had in her previous start. But, I mean, how long can this last for this horse? She was never this kind of horse. She was in Southern California. If you look at her SoCal farm before, she's got, I mean, just not, not anything like she's run the last two times. Can she maintain it? Maybe. She's a one-dimensional closer. She's going to be, I mean, she's going to get bet. She's going to be a strong second choice. She'll, she might even challenge Vasilika for favoritism. And when I saw the name Toinette pop up, um, that was very interesting to me because number eight, Toinette, who I ended up picking in this race, and I, I'm definitely looking forward to betting. Um, she's got a lot going for her. I mean, I, I, were you that, do you remember her well from last year, Dan, and what she did? I certainly do. Uh, she had her coming out party in the Edgewood on Kentucky Derby weekend, and she beat Rushing Fall and Daddy is a Legend. We've already mentioned those horses. I thought she got a very good setup in that race. Yeah. Rushing Fall and Daddy is a Legend moved very early, and Toinette took advantage. The Belmont Oaks is a race I completely threw out because it apparently uh, appears she was injured. I was so impressed with her race in the grade three autumn miss coming off of a layoff. It was the best she ever looked. She sat outside. She blew by that field on the turn. She kept to her task. It was professional. It was fast. It was a race where you wanted to see more. And unfortunately, we haven't seen her in six months. But she's trained by a guy named Drysdale who knows how to get one ready off the bench. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think they're messing around. I think she's primed to win first time out. I, I saw watched her last two workouts on online. The six furlong, she worked with the same horse and company. The six furlong walk work was good, but I feel like she was already kind of almost there with all the work he'd done with her before then. And I thought her last work, the half mile of company work, was excellent. She was, I mean, she wanted to do a lot. I think she's primed for a big effort. She relaxes nicely. And yeah, she, I mean, rushing fall was fixed to get run down in that Edgewood after being rank early. And she, she, she wasn't at her best that day, but there were several horses coming at the end. And this is the filly that really strode out at the wire. I think she's got a real nose 
for winning. She's four for five on turf. I think she's got underappreciated talent, and if she could just stay, you know, stay sound, keep in a rhythm for long enough to, to get going, she she might end up being a pretty legitimate turf horse, especially in a depleted West Coast division. I just hope that Flavian Prat is riding Bellafina Teratoga, so you've got a different jockey on than a lot of people are familiar with. You've got the two big names. To me, it's a ripe situation to get a fair price and a very talented horse. And while it's likely we've probably seen Vasilika's best race, we've probably seen Bo Rico's best race, I'm not sure we've seen Toinette's best race. She's only been to the races six times in her career. I agree with you on Toinette. I think the price will be right, probably the third choice in the yellow ribbon. There you have it for this week. Three weekend game plan spot plays from Marcus Hirsch. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.